Welcome back to another episode of a very British space program. And uh, you find us just doing a little burn with Hesperus 2 Cirrus. This is performing its final burn as it closes in its encounter in Cirrus. It's been flying through space for quite a while now. Um, its sister craft has already completed its mission and this one is just gonna try and refine itself so that it goes nice and close to the surface of the dwarf planet. And, uh, and gets as much science as possible. Also coming up, we have some missions heading out to the outer planets in this episode, and we uh, we have a few more uh, manned or crewed flights. So yeah, please stay tuned, subscribe, like, comment down below, and um, let's get going, I think. It is April the 30th, 1964, and in the distance there, you can see that Hesperus 2 Cirrus is approaching its final destination. Well, we say final destination. It's not its final destination. It's, it's the final destination of its mission, approaching very rapidly as we speed towards it. But this craft, uh, this craft will be flying off into outer space, into, well, not into outer space, but into planetary space when this, uh, when this flyby finishes, because it will not be capturing around the dwarf planet that is Cirrus. We have uh, got a lot of power problems at the moment because those cells, those solar cells are not particularly efficient and we are quite a way out from the sun now. So when running with its antennae and its science equipment, this thing is not, uh, is not healthy for power. It's draining its batteries as we speak, but it is using every drop of electricity that it has right now to try and scoop up every tiny morsel of science as it speeds past the surface of the dwarf planet. You can see it's extremely reflective. There's a lot of light coming off the surface there. It's almost like it's a snowy ball of ice or something. Um, we could, we might get some data back from some of the, uh, the scientific equipment telling us that. Now, obviously, this uh, this craft was uh, was set off quite a long time ago. It's been traveling through space for quite a while. It uses some of our older row. I think it's one of the original row engines, which has a habit of failing. Um, we've got uh, an antenna on the top of there, which is directional, but it isn't the best we've got. It's going to take a long time to get this data back. Uh, but we're just gathering the data. The good thing is we can gather as much data as we can, and it doesn't matter how long it's gonna take to send it back. Our big pro concern will be power because those solar panels they're degraded, they've been out there a few years now, they're, they're, they're drained down, they're running down, they weren't the best to start with. Um, so hopefully we can actually get enough power from them. By disabling uh, avionics and things like that, we, we, we should be able to get a positive power output. And there we go, that's the, the passing by, the flying past of Cirrus there. It, uh, it, it basically, um, yeah, that was it. It was a, it was a, it was a quick, quick pass by. We got as much data as we could. We can see one side, and we're still collecting data because we do have a video camera on this craft. Obviously, one side of the uh, of the dwarf planet is really quite pockmarked. The other side, quite smooth. And it's we've got our ge geologists at home there, just trying to understand what's going on with this really weird little little system, this little tiny dwarf planet, and it's located near the asteroid belt. Um, in human terms, it's all, it was only identified, you know, you know, a hundred years ago, something like that. It's it's quite modern, modern planet, planetary body, and it's uh, it's it's close. It's it's just outside the orbit of Mars, and you know, it's an interesting little body for us to look at. But with that, the Hesperus two series of probes have completed their mission. They're done. They have got a hundred percent success rate. So, off we go to our next bit of uh, mission, and that is. On the 30th, sorry, the 20th of May, 1964, we are going to have Messenger 5 departing for Saturn. In the previous episode, we put it up into uh, into orbit, waiting for this. Um, it's going to aim to go to Saturn, and what we're going to try and do is bring it inside the rings of Saturn. We want to sit inside the rings of Saturn, coming in a slightly inclined orbit, just so we don't go through the rings, and then we're going to try and capture. This is going to be potentially a capture mission. However, we do figure out later on that actually there is another option for this. So up in orbit there, you can see the, the more modern craft in comparison to the Hesperus 2. This is a, a much sort of sort of rounder craft in many ways. It's got its transfer stage still attached and that will be going with it because it's got lots of fuel, but we're gonna we're gonna lose that once it's actually departing as it's heads out of the solar, the, the, the Earth system, it will actually use that because we're gonna use a lot of fuel on this departure burn. It is one of our bigger departure burns. The outer planets take a lot of Delta V to get at. Um, you'll also see that we're actually at a, an odd angle. We're, we're, 
we're having to go because of the angle of, of, of Saturn, the angle of our orbit and all these things, we've got a bit of an odd angle there. We're firing our RCS just to ullage our main engines. And then we're going to fire them and we're going to fire all of those engines at so once. Unlike some of the um, the Mars and Venus missions that, that use this inter intermediate transfer stage, we're going to fire all the engines here. We're using every drop of fuel in that in that stage right now. We're going to use absolutely everything, which means that the actual burn isn't too long. It's actually uh, it's actually a reasonably quick burn because we're firing out all that fuel at maximum rate. Um, even saying that though, this stage will not have enough delta V to get it to Saturn. So we will actually need to use a large proportion of the fuel in the actual probe itself, which will mean that this uh, this transfer stage will actually end up in an orbit of its own if we'd actually stuck some uh, some solar cells on it or a, a, a nuclear uh, isotope generator it would have actually been able to head out towards the outer planets it will not in effect it won't actually hit an outer planet or at least not in the next uh, 100 years or so we don't think but it will be out there it'll be sitting out there this craft will become one of the fastest craft that we've sent out obviously we have other probes going to the outer outer uh, planets so they're the same model as this, which is pretty much a duplicate probe. We're sending these, these duplicates out. They're, they're designed to have enough fuel and enough delta V to get exactly where we need to go. And there we go. Now we're firing off that, that probe engine um, just to give us that final push, that final bit there. Now, hopefully, we will have enough delta V on this craft to circularize. The aim is to actually bring it down so that we're actually in a, an elliptical orbit around Saturn, which allows us to sort of span the orbits of other bodies. And we may see... Uh, over time if we can actually get an interaction. But anyway, while that's heading out of the system, we have another flight to go. So that was the 20th of March. This is the 23rd of March. And before the Messenger 5's course correction, we are launching the Faraday 1B. This is flight F006 um, with pilot Matthew West and a scientist Marcia Seymour. And uh, the Faraday 1B is actually gonna be the last of the Faraday 1 craft. It's It's been retrofitted and its primarily role here is to actually test Test out our fuel cell technology. We've been working on fuel cells for a while, um, and so this craft has been outfitted with uh, some modifications to its main sort of structure to test out fuel cells, which was is hoped to give the crew around seven days in orbit. We've got uh, liquid oxygen, liquid uh, hydrogen on board in the special special containers that we're going to actually maintain them so that we don't lose them through boil off. And this craft will hopefully allow the uh, the crew to stay up in orbit using those fuel cells uh, for seven days. While they're up there, they're gonna be doing some star occlusion navigation and in-flight sleep analysis. And that will actually, we hope, finish the uh, the the initial uh, science program that the Faraday craft were, were sent up there to, to carry out, as well as developing and, and using this fuel cell. This fuel cell system will hopefully give the, the future Faraday craft a, a bit of a, um, um, first of all, a more a more adaptive life. We can actually use them for other things, but also increasing their longevity in space. Now, the aim is to actually give them the longevity at least that the Davy 2 craft had. The Davy 2 craft being our current longest serving sort of orbital craft in, in or on orbit craft, having around seven days of on orbit time. However, the, uh, the Faraday one or two that will come along hopefully will actually be much more functional in its ability to actually to carry out other roles for us and that's that's the hope that we can actually create um, a few variants of the craft that are going to be useful we will be losing some of the coloring that we currently have so the the the, the sort of noticeable tankage that we have on the bottom here will be being replaced we're going to change some of the engine arrangements and stuff like that um, but the craft itself will be evolving to to be much more sort of sort of involving of our, um, our capabilities and, and able to really take us forward to our next step. It will probably not be the final evolution of the Faraday, but it will be perfect for our near Earth work and for just generally from uh, from Earth to uh, to Earth, near Earth orbit work and things like that. So on orbit, the crew basically send, spend quite a lot of time actually continuing to work on their station keeping because that's actually really important to us. This is something we're going to have to look at in the very near future. So while the crew are on orbit doing that, um, at the same time, so this is still the 23rd of May, um, we have Messenger 5 carrying out a, a correction burn uh, to actually intercept Saturn in a, in, a, in a more sort of a more positive way, shall we say. We want to actually get into a nice close, close um, encounter. We want to come very close to the, to the, to the heavy 
gas giant's atmosphere there because we want to actually get a really nice all-birth effect so we can actually make full use of whatever delta v what fuel we have left when we're actually going to encounter it so the hope is that by doing that little burn there we're actually going to get nice and close to saturn and we can take full use of all the fuel we have left on the 30th of may 1964 after seven days on orbit the uh, the crew of flight f006 are ready to return home they've completed all the scientific and engineering tasks it is a hundred percent mission perfect so far in fact with the exception of the faraday x with its uh, slight uh, issue with uh, rcs and some slight slight tweaking of other missions it's pretty much the faraday one mission profiles have all been a hundred percent successful we do see our um shall we say it's the less than optimal uh, less than optimal uh, service module decoupling that we seem to do with this craft and that will be changing the service module sort of detachment process and and all of that will be changing for the uh, the upcoming craft modifications and and faraday 2 which is slated to come online in uh, in probably about a month's time we're looking at about a month until the first faraday 2 flies and the faraday 2 will actually have two variants but you'll you'll see them um I'll point out some of the variables when that comes down. But this uh, this craft's flying off over over the uh, the US and, and Canada there, and uh, it should be coming down into the North Atlantic, just around the coast of of the UK, hopefully, um, to be picked up, of course, by the, the Royal Navy, who have got quite used to collecting capsules that come down from space now and uh, looking after the pilots of, and, and scientists and engineers that come down with them and of course taking all the pictures and things like that the faraday craft have actually become a bit of a, a sort of standard experience now for the, the british public and for the commonwealth in general they've all sort of got quite used to uh, to to people coming in from space so it doesn't get the fanfare it used to in fact it doesn't even get onto bbc one anymore which is uh, a bit sad actually so with that down we move forward and you will see on the launch pad this looks like a faraday but it's a little different so it's the first of july 1964 and this is the first flight of a faraday 2 this is the faraday 2b and this is flight f007 hmm, i'm sure i can make a joke about a particular british spy but we won't we won't go there um the uh, the faraday 2a will actually make its appearance in a, in a few months it's got a few variations that uh, make it specific for its role but the faraday 2b is designed for a seven day duration in orbit and uh, is basically just a, a big improvement so this is its test flight and um, it's got a crew of laurie whitehead and janet Payne. Uh, both are our second astronaut class um janet Payne flew second seat in the faraday maiden mission uh, with Whitehead flying the second seat in the uh, White Javelin 3 mission, uh, E003. So both of them have experience of on-orbit activities. And you can actually see the craft there already. We've actually shortened the shroud of the um, of the nose cone there. We've actually um, flattened it on the top. Instead of having a standard cone, it actually has a, a flat end. And it also has less covering for the uh, parachute. And the flat covering on the top is actually released um once we get into the second stage of the craft and you can actually see earlier that was flying off there it gets fired off into the atmosphere and it will return to the planet but it's so so light it just burns up uh we are using the nine engine burn that we have developed with the uh with the white trident 2 and this those white trident 2 is apart from the different paint job is pretty much the same craft that we've been using for the previous uh, Faraday launches. So it, it's pretty much unchanged. The big change is in the uh, on the craft on the top there, which has basically just been refined. We've actually got the, uh, you can see there, the bottom and everything is just refined and changed. And that is partly to allow us to have two variants of it and to give it multiple roles. So you'll see there, it now has a selection of engines on the, on the back there to allow it to orientate. We've actually gone for smaller engines uh, spaced out um, just to give us uh, the control and thrust we need we don't need a lot of thrust on orbit we've identified because of the uh, profile for approach part of the station keeping practice was actually working on what is the uh, optimal sort of thrust pattern that we need for this craft and, and thrust control so after uh, a couple of days on orbit uh, at one altitude they were at a periapse of 190 kilometers and apoapse of 250. Uh, they then changed to a four days at a, a higher apoapse of around 500 to 700 kilometers and they spent about seven days in orbit um, 
their periaps were slightly too low, so they actually carried out two burns on orbit um, using uh, using their engines, which was uh, which was a nice use for the actual test flight. Um, the fuel cells did have um, quite a lot of power in them, which was which is big advantage for us. We actually we noticed that they were were quite efficient. Um, we there is a debate as to whether we could actually use solar cells for this uh, this craft and um, solar technology at the moment is difficult but it would be potential to uh, to augment the fuel cells and actually it, it sort of elongate the life of the craft there so we have a dual fl flow for it so on re-entry there you will actually see that we uh, we discard the service module when we're in the normal arrangement and that pushes the service module away before the RCS on the main return capsule actually puts it back into its return trajectory. Um, this is something that we're going to be doing much more often because primarily uh, it keeps the shrapnel away from us, <laughs> quite simply. Um, there was some concern on the Faraday 1 flights that things flying past that capsule could be quite dangerous. So we get a really good distance away now from that. The service module explodes on re-entry, but it's nowhere near the actual flight path of our probe and you can actually see that top cowling really carefully in fact you can see there you go Oof, there's the uh, service module exploding you can see the top cowling and the fact that we've really shortened that for this this module now oh with lots of explosions but again if that had been the old re-entry we potentially could have hit that so the capsule's coming down it's getting a bit of uh, burning off going there and uh, this will be touching down probably um I believe in in what looks like Canada. We're, we're coming down in Canada, which is uh, interesting. We I don't think we've landed in mainland Canada before. We seem to have come down a little bit uh, off target. We normally aim for a water North Atlantic or Australia landing. We're actually coming down in Canada. However, um, it's likely that you know because of this, this is probably planned. I'm, I'm sure it's probably planned. So the the Canadians who have put so much forward into the uh, into the Faraday program will actually get a capsule of their own to keep. So they're gonna to get to keep the uh, the Faraday 2 first test capsule. That's probably gonna go into a nice museum in Canada. I don't know whereabouts in Canada that would be. However, as we uh, come into landing, that is gonna be the end of this episode. We are just at the start of July, 1964, and it is time to move on. So from me until next time, have a great one.